Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, a potential turning point in the election campaign. The leaders lay out competing visions for Canada. The critical hits in tonight's French language debate. In Kabul, they called him Canadian Dave, a retired soldier who helped dozens get out of Afghanistan as the Taliban took control. We're only doing the best we can. Vivid memories of a fiery escape from the last person to get out of the Twin Towers alive. That's when I heard a voice, and it was a calm, clear voice, and told me to come this way. Canadian Leila Fernandez is hoping to make more U.S. Open magic. Some people used to say, oh my gosh, she's so crazy for training so much. It's not going to lead to anywhere, but she's just proved the exact opposite. This is The National. The federal leaders have less than two weeks to sway voters. It is not a lot of time in the grand scheme of things, but in an election that is shaping up to be closer than some predicted, the next 48 hours could play a decisive role. Yeah, the polls suggest a virtual deadlock at the top. Liberals marginally favored to win the most seats, but the Conservatives still appear to have the support of more voters. Tonight, five federal leaders arrived at the Canadian Museum of History in Gatineau, Quebec, hoping to get an edge. Tonight is the first of two official debates that may shape what Canada's next government looks like. So this evening, the leaders faced off in the French language debate. Our chief political correspondent, Rosie Barton, followed along for us. So Rosie, clearly the stakes are very high for all those leaders on stage tonight. You bet, Adrian. They probably couldn't be higher tonight, and tomorrow could be the defining moment for one of these parties. This was about as friendly as things got, with the Liberal leader and Conservative leader standing somewhat awkwardly beside one another. Each leader first asked to deal with the question of why the election now and whether they would commit to not calling a snap election before the four-year term. We did not want this election. Four of them agreed, but the leader who called the election in the first place did not answer. The first theme, the pandemic and health. And the question, are vaccines creating division in this country? Justin Trudeau has largely become a target of it. This isn't the time to be uh, dividing people. We need to work together at every level of government. We need to use all the tools we have, vaccines, daily rapid testing. Mr. O'Toole is saying that vaccination and testing is the same thing, but it's not at all the same thing. Why did you call elections, Mr. Trudeau? Why in the middle of a pandemic? Why? We need to fight together to fight COVID-19, not with this divisive approach. And that's precisely because we need, Canadians need to have a say in how we get out of this. But again and again, each leader pressed the Liberal leader to justify why the election was happening during a fourth wave. So why did you trigger these elections? You can blame people who are angry and not vaccinated, or you can try to educate them. And always the same answer from Trudeau. Well, viewers can see how deep the differences are in our positions on how the pandemic, the pandemic should be dealt with. Aaron O'Toole's recently costed plan came under attack when it came to promises on daycare. The Conservatives would promise a tax credit rather than a national child care plan, which would also mean cancelling the billions already promised to provinces. Our plan is going to help all families in Quebec. He doesn't understand the daycare system in Quebec. Quebec families have been waiting for months and even years for more spaces in daycare. And he says no. While this debate was for all of Canada, it was directed very much at the voters in Quebec. And when the Bloc Québécois leader suggested the Liberal leader could not speak for all of Quebec, Trudeau lashed out. You do not have a monopoly over Quebec. Many of us represent Quebec in the House of Commons. And I'd like to say to you this, Mr. Blanchet. When you say, Mr. Blanchet, that you don't want any interference from the federal government in Quebec, and I'm then the only leader who you can replace Mr. take uh, the Quebec government's record as if it's your own, it's a contradiction. You have no right to consider me not a Quebec Democrat. That was probably the spiciest moment of the debate. Now to see whether any of it sways anyone's vote or opinion on any of the leaders. Wow. Thank you, Rosie.
So as we have mentioned, this is one of two pivotal debates happening this week. The National will have comprehensive coverage of tomorrow night's English language debate. We will put questions directly to the federal leaders on issues relevant to Canadians to help you make your informed choice. That starts at 9 p.m. Eastern on CBC Television, CBC Radio 1, GEM, and cbcnews.ca. And then right after that, we will have analysis you'll need with a special edition of The National, including more from Chief Political Correspondent Rosie Barton and the Ad Issue panel. It's going to be a big night. Now, only hours before the start of this debate, the Conservative Party released a major part of its election platform, the detailed price tag behind some of their big promises. David Cochran walks us through the numbers and the reaction to that late drop on such an important day. We have a very ambitious plan to get our country back on its feet. On Tuesday, Aaron O'Toole insisted his plan will grow the economy by at least 3% a year and balance the budget within a decade. But his platform contained no numbers to support that claim because, he said, the parliamentary budget officer was still costing it. We said we would have an update from the parliamentary budget officer. We will have that, I hope, shortly. That prompted the PBO to tweet a rebuttal, making clear we release these costing estimates on dates selected by the parties. The time the Conservatives selected was just two hours before the French language debate, with Aaron O'Toole unavailable to take questions and with no time for his rivals to crunch the numbers before the leaders faced off. Those numbers show $51 billion in new spending over the next five years, with the deficit falling to $24.7 billion, which is $7.3 billion lower than what the Liberals are projecting. But to do that, Conservatives will cancel the $10 a day childcare agreements the Liberals reached with most provinces. And then there's the fine print of this big promise. I have a plan that has been very transparent about giving an extra $60 billion to our public universal health care system. Only $3.6 billion of that comes by 2026. The remaining $55 billion is pushed off until at least a second or third Conservative term in office. The Conservatives argue their policies will deliver the economic jolt the country needs to pay for this plan and even more. But that goal of 3% economic growth is nearly double what private sector economists say is likely or even possible, something the Liberals have been targeting. He's going to magically get the budget back to balance. He's not showing his work. He's not doing his homework. O'Toole is showing his work now, with less than two weeks until voting day. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, to the pandemic now, where Canada's western provinces are continuing to drive this country's fourth wave of COVID. Take a look at these numbers. Today, British Columbia reporting 814 new cases. That bumps its seven-day rolling average to 670. The picture in Alberta, not much better. It has 1,166 new cases and sadly 18 deaths, the most in a day since February. Saskatchewan is reporting 405 new cases in that province. For the second day in a row, more people were diagnosed with COVID than received a vaccination. So as caseloads hit new highs in Saskatchewan and as vaccinations stall, Omira Issa shows us from Regina how a summer of easing restrictions has many demanding a tighter grip on the reins once again. The lineup at the Saskatoon COVID testing site stretched out for blocks. Still, Aaron Janay felt it was important to take time off work and school to get his teenage son tested for his mild symptoms. In three of his several classes at school, he had been exposed to COVID last week. The classes were mostly unmasked, and of course, we know vaccination rates a little low. Saskatchewan lifted just about all its COVID restrictions on July 11th. Cases have been rising steadily since then. This week, the province set a record for average new cases over a seven-day period. It's the worst it's been since the beginning of the pandemic, and vaccination rates have hit a new low, trailing all other provinces except Alberta. Experts warn the province is at a breaking point. ICU capacity is certainly being stretched. Healthcare is being stretched. Um, Saskatchewan, to me, is in uh, certainly a, a predicament. 
we run out of critical care capacity, if we run out of hospital capacity, then we're going to be in a situation where, you know, COVID or not, vaccinated or not, like we're going to be in a situation where we may have to decide, you know, who lives and who dies. There are concerns many more people could have COVID in Saskatchewan and that cases could be falling through the cracks. Contact tracing is now left up to individuals who test positive. In addition, they are not required to isolate. Dozens of people in Saskatoon gathered today to demand more action. But we are the majority. People who want science. Another protest is planned at the legislature in Regina tomorrow. In a statement, the government says it is monitoring the situation very closely and will respond accordingly with the chief medical health officer and public health officials. Omera Isa, CBC News, Regina. Today, Nova Scotia became the latest province to announce a proof of vaccination policy. It will go into effect October the 4th and will be required for activities such as entering restaurants, fitness centers and movies. This gives us the best chance of staying open once we've opened. We do not want to shut the province down again. The province also announced it will enter phase five of its reopening plan next week. That will see the elimination of indoor masking and gathering limits. So it is time to crack out the pencil cases and notebooks. Millions of Canadian children are heading back to school this week. With many returning to in-person classes, that means all kinds of COVID safety protocols. Deanna Sumanak Johnson is talking with nervous teachers and nervous parents. I get to see all my friends this year again, and I'm just excited to be back. In St. John's, Newfoundland, students headed back to class today where things were looking pretty close to normal. No masks and high hopes. In Winnipeg, these girls know their school's COVID safety rules. Wear a mask. Wear a mask? Yeah. That's right. And not touch people. Yeah. And lots of? Distance. <laughs> and lots of? Hand washing. Across Canada, school safety protocols are different, but anxiety is common for parents. This Ontario mother sent her children back to class for the first time since March 2020. We went through a whole drill of how, how to go to the washroom, what to do, what to do with masks, how to eat our food, how to stay away. It's been, it's been stressful, I'm not going to lie. Teachers are feeling this stress too. I don't know why there isn't a national mandate uh, to ensure that masking happens uh, from kindergarten right through to grade 12 across, across the country. With the Delta variant so contagious, cases are popping up among teachers and students even before classes start. Experts say many Canadian school boards already have strong safety protocols. I think the some of the regions have hit on a lot of the important things. So we've heard a lot about improvements in ventilation. But there's more that can be done. I'd like to see um, you know some more supports in terms of potentially doing the ASIM symptomatic uh, testing, especially in the beginning of this year. Students in Toronto and Ottawa will see measures that go beyond the provincial rules. Ottawa is restricting sports, while the Toronto District School Board requires staff to be vaccinated and is asking the province to mandate shots for all eligible students. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the U.S. Secretary of State and top diplomat Antony Blinken was in Germany today looking to shore up allied support for dealing with the Taliban. Yesterday's announcement about the Taliban's interim government is being met with skepticism. We're assessing the announcement, but despite professing that a new government would be inclusive, the announced list of names consists exclusively of individuals who are members of the Taliban or their close associates and no women. Now today, this graphic and unsourced video emerged from Kabul. It reportedly shows women protesting the new all-male government, but the group was forced to disperse after being beaten with whips. The Taliban has not responded, but warned that such demonstrations were illegal. Now, as the Taliban reclaimed control of the country, we all remember those terrible scenes, right, of so many Afghans desperate to escape. Well, tonight we meet one Canadian who went to extraordinary lengths to rescue Afghan interpreters. The people he was helping knew him only as Canadian Dave. He told his story to Judy Trin. This is what David Lavery saw when he walked around the Kabul airport. Tens of thousands fleeing the Taliban. The din of their despair echoes in his mind. I 
actually was pretty horrible. It's hard to process, but there's a constant hum, 24 and 7, um, of noise, of desperation, of panic. Lavery is a retired Canadian Special Forces soldier who operated a private security company in Kabul. After the embassy closed, Lavery remained at the airport to rescue refugees. Amid the chaos, he had a list of more than 1,200 people who assisted Canadian soldiers in Afghanistan. Wendy Long was helping him from her Ontario home. There was very little sleep involved. Her group of volunteers used secure chat rooms to guide Afghans to safe houses and to the airport. I would say, Canadian Dave's looking for you, uh, you know, put, put whatever you have and start waving red and chanting Canada uh, so that he can, he can view you. Meanwhile, Lavery would use his cell phone to scan the crowds, allowing volunteers to see the rescues in real time. What's going to happen is we're going to take you and put you into our little Canadian enclave. The smiling faces on the other side of that gate, uh, it encouraged us to keep going. Lavery is credited with helping at least 100 people escape, but many more were left behind. You could hear people on the other side who knew me, David, don't leave us, David, don't leave us. We're here, and they stayed there for days, you know, trying to get in, trying to get hope, but I couldn't open that door. Eleven days after Kabul fell, Lavery and his wife boarded a German transport plane. Not the way I expected to leave Afghanistan after all these years. Before the ramp closed, they heard explosions from a suicide attack. They were safe, but leaving a nation in tatters. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. Just weeks ago, Canadian tennis player Leila Fernandez wasn't really on a lot of people's radar. Her rise at the U.S. Open catching many by surprise. Alison Northcott with how years of hard work have prepared Leila for the most important match of her career yet. Last night, another win for Canadian Leila Fernandez, another step in her remarkable rise in the tennis world. I always knew like she, she had it in her. Like, Love star Alexis is also a Quebec tennis player and a friend of Fernandez. Some people used to say, oh my gosh, she's so crazy for training so much. Like it's not gonna, it's not gonna lead to anywhere, but she's just proved that the exact opposite. Fernandez started playing tennis in Montreal. Her father says she's worked tirelessly from the start. After some early setbacks, he promised to stand by her and started coaching her himself. I said, okay, well, I'm going to put my money where, where my mouth is and I'm just going to learn about this sport and I'm going to study it and study everything and everyone and, you know, I'm going to see what it takes you know, to make it to the top. He told me to go out there, have fun, fight for every ball, fight for every point. That fight and her grit have paid off. I remember being on the court with her. She must have been 11, and I was really impressed even then by her ability to take the ball so early. And that's been her signature. That's been her trademark, this ability she has to go on the court day in and day out and go at it full out. As the 19-year-old prepares to play the U.S. Open semifinal tomorrow, so many fans are behind her. What she's doing on center stage is going to resonate. The Filipino-Canadian Tennis Association of Saskatchewan is planning a viewing party to cheer on Fernandez, who is of Ecuadorian and Filipino descent. There is someone that can make it, that can, that can change the, that get the crowd to really rally behind her. And by seeing a Filipina face in there, um, she's going to inspire a lot of people. To and he says the fact that another Canadian player, Felix Auger Aliasim, is in the men's semi final adds even more to the excitement. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. With less than two weeks to go before Election Day, Canadians are looking at where the parties stand on some of the biggest issues of our time. I've got two little kids and they're growing up in a world that doesn't have a lot of promise. Up next, why some are rallying for more political action on climate change. And later, with vaccines being mandated in many parts of the country, some people are asking for exemptions. So how often are you getting these requests exactly? Dozens per morning or hundreds per week. But who actually qualifies? Plus. Why did I survive when so many of my colleagues didn't? How did I get out when they didn't? 20 years after 9-11, some Canadians are still living in its shadow. We're back in two.
Welcome back. Rallies were held in more than 60 communities across Canada today as part of a day of action on climate change. Thousands of protesters, all demanding Ottawa do more. And as Paige Parsons reports, the timing of this coast-to-coast -coast event was no coincidence. Frustrated by a lack of political leadership on climate change, this Toronto dad brought his kids to a day of nationwide protest ahead of the federal leaders' debates tonight and tomorrow. I've got two little kids and they're growing up in a world that doesn't have a lot of promise as a livable place for them. So I'm increasingly frustrated that the, that the uh, urgency doesn't seem to be reflected in, uh, in, what, in what our leaders are doing. Spearheaded by climate advocacy group 350 Canada, protesters are demanding candidates commit to stopping fossil fuel expansion and make a plan to transition workers to greener jobs. This is the most important issue right now. It's the most important issue for the election coming up. And it's just not getting the attention it deserves in all of the other things that are happening right now. Without a planet, we don't have anything. Even here in oil-rich Alberta, there are people calling for a halt to new fossil fuel projects. In fact, the health of the earth is a key election concern. Depending on the poll, uh, it's climate change is identified as the top of mind issue, number two or number three, De you know, depends on how the pollster asks the question. So it's certainly a, a significant concern. Harrison says it's increasingly difficult to ignore the effects of climate change and the havoc extreme weather has wreaked on people around the world. Here in Canada too, like flooding, record-breaking heat and wildfires. Even now, months later, crews in BC are still battling more than 200. At the protest in Toronto, six-year-old Frederick has a message for political leaders. Please change what you're doing right now and please make sure that everyone has a good future to live in. Hopeful, whichever party is elected come September 20th, is listening. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. There is concern, too, about another issue that has yet to grab attention on the campaign trail. We are two-thirds through this election race and barely a word has been spoken about Islamophobia, even though not long ago the country was reeling from a horrific hate crime. Rafi Bujakanian has more on a community still suffering. Our community has been living in this new normal for quite some time. That new normal? Islamophobia uglier than ever. Take this letter sent to the Langley Islamic Center, warning it to shut down and glorifying both Hitler and the killer behind the New Zealand mosque shooting of 2019. We all expect to be able to pray freely. We expect to be able to put a signboard up outside of our Islamic Center so that, you know, we can tell everybody that we're here. Three months ago, all major party leaders showed up at a vigil in London, Ontario, commemorating the Afzal family, four of them killed in what police called an Islamophobic attack. We hold you in our thoughts. We will not cower in fear. This entire community and this entire country stands with you. But the National Council of Canadian Muslims points out the subject barely come up on the campaign trail. I don't understand what more needs to happen. This summer, it issued 60 recommendations to Ottawa, including creating a special envoy on Islamophobia and a commitment to fight Quebec secularism law in court. Bill 21 prevents provincial public sector workers from wearing religious symbols. If my wife travels with me to Quebec. She can't become a prosecutor. No major party is making that commitment, but they all want to create new online hate legislation, though the Conservatives have had to field questions about omitting the word Islamophobia from their platform. Well, we're going to be working with the National Council, with, with other organizations. The main three parties have all just issued statements condemning hatred. Still, the National Council of Canadian Muslims would like to see them start talking about Islamophobia on the campaign trail. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, it is a question that's coming up more and more with vaccine mandates taking shape across the country. The vast, vast, vast majority of people, they don't actually fit that medical exemption category. Yeah, up next, who does qualify for a medical exemption? Plus. Fortunately, as much as I tried, I was not good enough as a goalie, and baseball came along. A made in Canada journey all the way to the Hall of Fame. That's coming up.
Welcome back. Increasingly, proof of vaccination measures are becoming the rule rather than the exception across the country. Many Canadians already live with vaccine passports just to have a meal out at a restaurant. But there's always an asterisk, isn't there? Show proof or that you have a medical exemption. But have you ever wondered who actually qualifies for a medical exemption? Here's the answer. <laughs> This is what Lee Eliason would call a good day. It's always been a challenge. I've been ill for over 20 years now. Thankfully, I'm, I'm in a pretty, I would say, stable place right now. But to us, she sums up her medical history as complicated. I've had times in life where I've been bedridden for years at a time. My neurological system went wonky. Lights were too bright, sounds were too loud, crippling head pain. I've also had heart problems and arrhythmias and heart surgeries. You can see why she's petrified by the thought of an adverse reaction, any reaction really, to the COVID vaccine. She's not anti-vax or anti-science, but for her, the question marks are paralyzing. The idea of possibly setting myself back is terrifying to me. In the last several weeks, the worlds of the unvaccinated have gotten smaller. If you work at Air Canada, LCBO, the big banks, if you want to attend university, live in residence, go see a Jays game, in some provinces even eat at a restaurant or go to a gym, you'll often either need proof of vaccination or an exemption. And you get one of those from a guy like this. Dr. Jason Perfetto is a family physician in Hamilton, Ontario. So how often are you getting these requests exactly? The requests and inquiries about exemption notes and letters, we're talking about dozens per morning or hundreds per week. He very much wants to help, but Dr. Profetto tells us he hasn't issued any exemptions, not a single one, and he doesn't know any doctor who has. Hey, Andrew. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, it's been really nice having you on speed dial, Dr. Chagla. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's good. The exemption piece is something a lot of groups are struggling with. And for the vast, vast, vast majority of people, they don't actually fit that medical exemption category. What are you telling me that a cancer patient, eligible or not eligible for a medical exemption? Not eligible for a medical exemption. And in fact, should be at the top of the list to get vaccinated. Someone with an autoimmune disease, would they be eligible for an exemption? No, they would, uh, again, not be exempt. There's no evidence that uh, vaccines set off autoimmune conditions. And so, again, they would be on the top of the list because of the highest risk of complications. Someone with heart complications, cardiac issues, exemption or no exemption? Yeah, as long as they're in, in good shape, they're not having an acute cardiac issue, they, again, can, can very much get a vaccine. But we know some Canadians have been able to get medical exemptions. What about a vaccine allergy, specifically to a compound called PEG? We're talking about polyethylene glycol, which mm -hmm. you can find specifically in the mRNA vaccines. Mm. Is this a common allergy? Can it lead to a severe reaction if you get these vaccines? Yeah, so PEG is a, a really, really common compound in our environment. Here's what Dr. Chagla means. Uh, polyethylene glycol, or PEG, is in all of these things, from creams to conditioners, laxatives, Tylenol, cosmetics. And even if you did have a true PEG allergy, you wouldn't even necessarily react to the vaccine. And most people are usually just fine under supervision. That allergy, even though it's really documented, is rare. And again, the odds of being anaphylactic to it are rare. And on top of that, the odds of being anaphylactic to the vaccine is even rarer. But but if I'm understanding you correctly, if we're only talking about, let's say, first vaccine doses, mm. is there any known medical condition that would absolutely prevent someone from getting the COVID vaccine? No, again, not to my knowledge. There's very little on that first dose that is an exemption to, to, uh, to vaccination. But that doesn't make life any easier for family doctors, because for those on the front line, it's rarely just about the science. You're also trying to think of the human being and you're trying yes. to inject some compassion into your decision. Yes. As well, is that fair to say? In a world of black and white, I work in the gray. We need to use science. We need to use medical evidence. We need to trust our experts. We have to. And at the same time, we need to come down to earth we need to be sensitive and understanding of individuals' differences and opinions. 
and proceed in the most appropriate manner that we can. So where does that leave someone like Lee? It gets even more complicated because not only is there no national standard, who's exempt, who's not, there isn't even consensus on whether medical exemptions should be allowed at all. We're all in this uh, whirlwind of information that seems to be changing daily. Where she lives under BC's new vaccine passport system, there are no exemptions. But if she lived in Ontario or Quebec, a note from her doctor would make all the difference. So I suppose I just have to wait and see what happens. So slowly but surely, guidelines are mm -hmm. trickling out in terms of who should and who shouldn't qualify for an exemption. But as Dr. Chagla told us, it's a pretty slim list. Okay, so as I understand it, almost no medical exemption for the first dose. But, but what about the second? Right, and so that is exactly where you'll find most often the medical grounds for a medical exemption, right? Mm -hmm. So that is to say, if you have a, a truly adverse reaction after the first dose, then it's certainly worth consulting to see if you should get an exemption for the second dose. But as far as being able to draw any kind of, you know, straight line between condition X and how you might react to that first dose, right. really hard to okay. find. Okay. Yeah. All right. As we approach the 20th anniversary of 9-11, we are hearing the stories of those touched by the terrible moments of that terrible day. It didn't register at the time, you know, that he was saying goodbye. And then he hung up, and that was at 9.22 a.m. Up next, two Canadians, two decades later, and the difficult path forward. Welcome back. The world was so changed by the September 11th attacks 20 years ago this week. As that anniversary approaches, we are looking back, reflecting on that moment and on the journey since. Tonight, a few Canadians share with Ioanna Miliotis how their worlds were also changed on that devastating day. Oh my God. And I'm like, Frank, are you okay? He says, Kimmy, he says, we were thrown to the floor out of our chairs. He says, I'm trapped on the 87th floor. He says, it's getting difficult to breathe. And he says, you need to promise me every day for the rest of their lives that you tell Zoe and Garrett how much I love them. It didn't register at the time you know, that he was saying goodbye. And then he hung up, and that was at 9.22 a.m. It was a beautiful day. There was a big, loud explosion. And then as I was leaving the trading floor, the plane hit our building. The right wing sliced straight through our trading room. I got knocked flying. Debris came down on us, and then we went into the stairwell. Why did I survive when someone and my colleagues didn't? How did I get out when they didn't? For Kimmy Shadell and Ron DeFrancesco, 9-11 is not only burned in their mind's eye, it's seared in their souls. They can't forget where they were when, but 20 years later, we also wanted to know where they are now. Every time I think about it, it brings me back into the building, the tower the stairwell and what went on. Ron is said to be the last known survivor of the World Trade Center attack. He escaped through a burning stairwell. So it's still a hard story to tell. The smoke was getting pretty thick and heavy. People were starting to drift off and go to sleep. Um, and that's when I heard a voice and call me and it was a calm clear voice and told me to come this way so I went towards the thickest smoke and the fire and I pulled back a sheet of drywall to reveal the staircase below um, I slid down there and then ran through three flights of stairs that were on fire and then I ran down who is that voice? <laughs> so some say it may be God or an angel, and some say it may just be me, you know, my adrenaline. But um, it was a clear, calm voice. And Ron doesn't know how he got out. He ended up in hospital, a gash on his head, a broken bone in his back, and burns to most of his body. His contact lenses had melted to his eyes. His wife, Mary, was shocked when she saw him. I wasn't sure he was going to survive, and I felt incredibly grateful that he was alive, that he got out of the towers, and I, 
um, promised myself then that I would try to be worthy of the gift of his life. It would take months to get on his feet. Ron and his family moved back home to Toronto. And while life moved on, Ron says he couldn't. Mary took the brunt of everything. She took care of the kids, took care of the house, took care of the family. I was blank for a long while, right? I just, I didn't care about anything. I, I didn't want to hear noises. I just, I was void of life, I guess. I was just existing. What was that like for you, Mary? Well, physically, he recovered, but emotionally he sort of disappeared. And, and the kids noticed and they, you know, wondered why he was angry, wondered why he was sad. And it wasn't enough to survive. You know, we had to learn to thrive again. And that was tough. Focusing on charity work and speaking about mental health has helped. Everybody struggles with their mental health at some point in time, and what can we do to help make it better for people, for ourselves? And so if I talk about it, I, I feel a bit better after I do a talk. What's in all these binders? So these are all cards. And there has been so much support do. over the years. Binders bulging with notes of well wishes and tucked away. Ron's watch still encased in dust. It stopped at 9.59 a.m., the moment the South Tower came down. They're just important reminders of how close we came and how near death Ron was. But Ron says he still walks a fine line between gratitude and guilt. I left a lot of colleagues there, right, in the stairwell. So I'll carry that with me forever. Is it a miracle? Is it luck? Is, am I blessed? I don't know. What do you think? I'm blessed I got 20 more years of life, right? And if I get one more day, it's a bonus, so. Frank Doyle wasn't as lucky. He was just a really special, unique person, very loving, very funny, crazy about the kids. Frank worked on the 87th floor of the South Tower. When I first met his wife, Kimmy Shadell at Ground Zero, she was clinging to the hope that he was still alive. I just feel like I gotta find him and I gotta bring him home one way or another. In my heart, I thought, you know, maybe he came down with the building, maybe they found him, maybe he can't remember, you know, who he was, maybe he didn't have his wallet on him. It was just so devastating. It was like, in my mind, I, I was trying to convince myself he's gonna come home, he has to come home. Because you were, you were two years old. Mm -hmm. You can't have many memories, or do you have any? I have a few memories with my dad. Not sure if they're real memories, but it doesn't, doesn't matter now. No. Just the fact that I feel like I did know him and I remember some things. Kimmy was determined to keep her husband's memory alive for her kids. She left their home in the U.S. and moved back to Quebec right. to start what would become a lifelong mission. I think, how did this, you know, little girl from St. Marguerite, Quebec, end up in New York City, falls in love with an American, and he dies in a terrorist attack? Like, I still sometimes kind of take a step back and, and think, like, did this, is this actually our story? And now my focus has really been Frank's legacy and, you know, what we can do and, and what we can create in terms of change um, and to give back and to live our lives you know, in a positive way and try to make something positive out of this. Frank was an avid athlete, so friends and family gathered to hold triathlons in his name every summer. In the last few years, the focus shifted to building preschools in South Africa in his memory, with the help of her children, including Zoe. When I think about my dad, I don't think about 9-11 and the tragedy and everything, and I think it's because of this team and the support system that we were raised with and how, how she decided to raise us and be strong for us and always be so positive um, that we're lucky in many ways. 20 years is a long time. Kimmy found love again, but in another devastating blow, lost her partner Francois two years ago to cancer. Kimmy says Africa, the inspiration behind it, has saved her. This is from June of 2018. Wow, amazing. But in each of these tragedies, I realize that when I go to Africa soon after, I feel like I'm gonna be okay. When I go on these trips, it's like I heal faster. I feel like I have a purpose. Um, I'm happier. I, I don't know how you do it. Um, 
but it, it's been incredible to see how far we've come. 9-11, it made fragments of their lives, but they're still finding light through the pieces that will always be missing. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Well, with the Winter Olympics in China fast approaching, there are growing calls to boycott the Games. I don't think a public broadcaster in particular can, can take the stance that celebrating the Games is in the best interest of, uh, of Canada. Why the pressure is on to make a stand against Beijing. Well, Tokyo's Olympic and Paralympic Games have wrapped, but not too far away. The Winter Games will start in Beijing, and there are already boycott campaigns in full swing over China's human rights record, past and present. As Thomas Daigle explains today, the pressure was focused on broadcasters, including the CBC. Broadcasting the Olympics means big business, providing major sponsors with massive visibility. From Kyung Chang, and welcome to tonight's primetime broadcast presented by Visa. NBC alone pays billions for TV rights, accounting for up to 40% of the International Olympic Committee's total income. Now, protests against the upcoming Beijing Games are taking aim at broadcasters. The new pushback coming in the form of this letter, signed by about 200 human rights groups saying your companies are at serious risk of being complicit in severe and worsening human rights abuses. All of these organizations have an obligation to speak up now. Tibetan rights activist Ladin Tetong spoke out against the 2008 Beijing Games too. For that, she was detained and deported. Genocide has to be the red line. There has to be a place they won't go. China denies accusations from the international community that it's indoctrinating and killing its Uyghur Muslim minority. But there's also the continued detention of Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver. Games organizers are refusing to denounce China's human rights record, even when asked directly about the repression of Uyghurs. Where we bring uh, the athletes of the world uh, together in a peaceful uh, competition. But critics say hosting in 2008 emboldened China, and that can't be allowed to happen again. I don't think a public broadcaster in particular can, can take the stance that celebrating the Games is in the best interest of, uh, of Canada. Activists want Olympic broadcasters like CBC to cancel plans to air the Games. The corporation would only say it remains concerned about human rights issues in China and will continue to shine a light on them. In other words, in February, the show will go on. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, high honors for a Canadian baseball star. In tonight's moment, we will show you how Larry Walker and his family made sure no one forgets his Canadian roots. Larry Walker's rise to fame started on the hockey rink before he moved to the baseball diamond. But today, the Canadian baseball star was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. So Walker is just the second Canadian to achieve that honour. His induction was delayed by the pandemic, but the moment he finally got to take his place as a Hall of Famer, that's our moment. I always be grateful that the Montreal Expos took a chance on me and gave me an opportunity to play baseball professionally. To all the Expo fans and people of Montreal, it was a great honour to put on the Expo uniform and represent my home country. It was exciting, very exciting. I, I was really nervous when I first got there. I didn't know what to expect and what was going on. But as I settled down and saw all the guys, uh, things really relaxed. And of course, thank you, Canada, for all your support I've received throughout the years from my home country. I share this honour with every Canadian. And I hope that all you Canadian kids out there that have dreams of playing in the big leagues, that see me here today, gives you another reason to go after those dreams. I am truly honoured, humbled, to be part of the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And it is a privilege to be part of this family right here. Thank you all so much. Heck of a talent in Larry Walker. Also a heck of a story. I mean, you mentioned how he started in hockey and yeah. then moved to baseball. When he was 16, he was offered tryouts at two uh, junior A teams, cut from both teams, Ouch. decided 
maybe hockey's not his thing and Who baseball needs would hockey? work out. Yeah. Baseball will do. <laughs> that was, of course, his family in the front row wrapped in the Canadian flag. They were surrounding him uh, the day he got the call about being inducted. It's a pretty tight mm. unit. Congratulations. That is a national for September the 8th. Good night. Good night.